to turn back to that uh, chapter that we read, Ezekiel chapter 13. We live in a, in a day when emotion has been elevated to the highest place. The most important thing is how people feel. Speaking from your heart, your own thoughts and ideas is seen as the most important thing. The moment I am going through a book by the theologian Carl Truman called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And he quotes in the third chapter a, a philosopher, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who very much delved into this idea that the inner self um, was to rise above all the pressures of society and all the influences of those around us and to be true to self. To be true to your own self was uh, the great goal. And of course, people of the present day have taken that ideology much further than such a philosopher of the 18th century could have ever imagined. The present chapter speaks to the nonsense of this modern philosophy, and indeed we see in this chapter, which was prophesied over two and a half thousand years ago, it's not a new philosophy. Because the ones who are condemned in this chapter had the very same mindset. The mindset was, it's my thoughts, my heart, my understanding, and my words under the pretense that it was God's word, under the lying that this was the word of God. So as you will see, and I sent the outline of the message this morning in our in our group, we see five points in this chapter, the problem diagnosed, the prophets described, the pronounced decree, the peace of delusion, and the pillows of the seed. So let us look at this chapter under those five headings. First of all, the problem diagnosed. It's always important, isn't it, to know what the problem is, but much more important or equally as important, who is going to make the diagnosis? So if you want to understand a physical health issue, you go to a medical doctor. And if you're still unsure, you might go to a second for a second opinion. But here in this chapter, there is only one opinion that matters. There's only one who is qualified to make the diagnosis, to describe the problem, to uncover the cancer that lies beneath the nation's lies and deception. And that is the word of the Lord. And Ezekiel describes it as the word of the Lord came to me. And we'll see in the rest of the chapter the one thing that was missing in the life of Israel at this time and indeed in many of its generations was that the word of God was not heard. The word of God was not received. And here Ezekiel has the advantage because the word of God comes to him. Very strong language and very specific language. The, the idea of the, the word of God making its way, not just being a, a book on a table, not just Ezekiel reading the Bible, but the word of God traveling to him from God, communicating from God to him. And therefore, Ezekiel is supremely qualified, eminently qualified to speak to the real problem that existed in his day and that led to the Babylonian captivity and the judgment of God giving the people over to the Chaldeans. 
But then who does it concern? Son of man, verse 2. Prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. Notice Ezekiel's ministry is to be, at least in this sense, a negative ministry. He is to preach against the prophets of Israel. He is to be in danger of considered to be a troublemaker. To point out the problems and indeed the very people that call themselves the prophets of Israel, he was to be a messenger against these prophets. He was to speak against them. So therefore Ezekiel was not called to be popular. One preacher once said, if you want to be popular, sell ice cream and sell it as cheaply as possible and then you'll be very popular. If you don't want to be a popular person, be a preacher, and especially one who will speak the truth. Here the issue is so important that not only is Ezekiel to speak in general terms, you know, and, and many take that option, don't they? They see the problems that exist in the church, but they don't want to... Uh, it's sort of the boys' club mentality. They don't want to address the issues. They want to be popular. They don't want people to say negative things about them. Here Ezekiel does not have that option. He does not have the convenience of just being a general preacher of the Word of God. He must be specific. What's the problem? What's the problem that is addressed in verse 2 and verse 3? It's this. Speak to the ones or say to them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Now when we say that in Scripture, we're not talking about the the, the pump in our chest. We're, we're talking about here. They preach out of their own minds. Or as Calvin so often said, out of the vacuum of their own brain, the emptiness of their own brains. Say unto them that prophesy out of their own minds, their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. And again, not only the implication, but it's it's clear in this text that the one thing that had not happened is that they had not heard the word of God. The word of God had not made that journey to these prophets. And therefore, for the first time, they're to hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets. So uh, Ezekiel has the protection that this is not his preaching. It is God speaking. And when we're going to be unpopular, we need this protection. We need at least to know that we have one on our side. That we have one who will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that is the Lord. These are they that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. They are either completely deceived themselves or they are, frankly, just deceivers and probably both. They follow their own spirit. This is the spirit of today, isn't it? This is the spirit of the age. Following your own desires, your own heart, your own mind, what you think is right. As it says earlier in the scriptures, that each one done uh, according to their own ways. Every man walked in his own path. This is the great problem. And this problem has never changed. It's still the same. Yes, it's taken time to get where we are in this generation. But as we said in the introduction... 
the, the foundations for it are not only in the 18th century, but all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Because when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, they followed their own heart. They followed their own mind. What it says that Eve saw it looked good and it was beneficial for to give knowledge. Therefore, she went with her feelings. She went with her understanding. It's never changed. In fact, the only thing that keeps this problem back is the Word of God. I think our sister Cindy gave the illustration of the, the escalator during the week. And the escalator is constantly uh, moving a certain direction. And if you stand on the escalator, you will inevitably go one way. So you have to actively go against the direction that it wants and that, that it does go in. That's a good illustration of humanity without the Word of God. Humanity without the, the corrective of the Word of God. We need to be constantly corrected, constantly reformed, constantly brought back. Semper reformanda is the phrase, isn't it? We need to be constantly reforming or always reforming because there's an, an inevitability, even as believers, that we will drift in the wrong direction without being corrected by the Word of God. You see, we're not here this morning, as I often remind you, just to add some knowledge to all the knowledge that we already have. We have come here this morning because we need correction. That's what Second Timothy says. The Word of God is able to correct and to rebuke and to reprove and to exhort and so on. We need that constant work of the Word of God. So this is the problem diagnosed. But then... Secondly, the prophets described. In verse 3, they are called foolish prophets. What, a, what an oxymoron. What a, an apparent contradiction. I, I mean, a prophet is, is meant to be, by the very name, to be filled with wisdom, the, the word of God, and, and understanding to, to teach others. And here they're called Foolish prophets. My people are destroyed for lack of wisdom. Hosea could mourn. God, through the prophet, mourns this fact. We live again in a stupid generation. I'm not saying that to be... To be uh, unkind. But the, the mind of man is stupid apart from the Word of God. It says in the Proverbs that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. By nature, we are foolish. By nature, we're stupid. We need to be educated by the Word of God. We need to be corrected by the Word of God. But here the ones that are meant to be doing the correcting themselves are fools. Themselves need someone to use another verse to show them what be the very first principles of the Word of God. So that's their minds, but then their image. What do they look like? What does God say they look like? Verse 4, they're like foxes in the deserts. They are worthless. Of no use. What use is a fox in the desert? It's worthless. We see their failings in verse 5. Their worthlessness goes on from the image to the action or the lack of action thereof. Ye have not gone into the gaps neither made a hedge for the house of Israel. So you haven't filled in the gaps where the danger is. You've not made up the hedge, the protection for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They'd become useless. I remember many years ago, 
going to a church of Ireland not too far from here, probably about 25 years ago, and the minister stood up. It was a certain time of the year, and the minister stood up to uh, to speak. And his message was on the secret ingredient of Christianity. And as he went on, I, I hoped that he would get to the point where he would say it's Christ. But when it came to the to the punchline of the sermon, and we, he's going to give what the the secret ingredient of Christianity is. His answer was this: living by the precepts of the Ten Commandments. A useless. Useless prophet, a useless, a foolish minister who's not filling the gap, who's not putting the hedge of protection around the people of God, who's basically telling them, well, just live the best life you can. And that's the secret ingredient. No, Christ is the special formula for the Christian life. Because we cannot keep the Ten Commandments. That's not to say we're not to keep the law or to do everything we can to keep it. But that's not the secret. That's not what makes Christianity special. It's knowing Christ. It's knowing Him. It's knowing Him as my Lord and Savior. It's knowing that no matter how many times I fail... He is my King. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. And these ones back in Ezekiel's day had no message, had no protection for the people, had no usefulness in their ministry. Spurgeon says to one preacher who said that he had nothing in his sermon about Christ, go away till you have something to say about Christ. A sermon that is Christless is no sermon at all. A sermon that does not bring Christ to the people of God is of no use. You see, the problem of the liberal ministers today is not just that they're a bit dodgy in certain areas. They, they've lost the formula. That they've lost the power. All they have is outward form, and that is pretended, just like in Ezekiel's day. Lying messages, lying prophecies based upon deceit and deception. And that's why the prophet speaks of their character in verses 6 and 7. Look at their character. They have seen vanity or emptiness Lying divination, to use the words of the apostle, deceivers and being deceived, saying the Lord saith, oh, this is, this is God's word. It's not just Romanism that says they have a message from God. It's all the false prophets of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements that say the Lord said to me, and God says, the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. A false hope. Not only are they worthless prophets because they don't protect the people of God, but they expose the people of God to vanity and to false expectation. Selling the lie and so sending God's people into darkness. Have you not seen a vain vision, verse 7 says, and have you not spoken by a lying divination? Here it takes the form of uh, just like in a, in, a, in a courtroom situation where they're being put under examination. Is this not true? Is this not the case? Whereas ye say, the Lord saith it, 
albeit I have not spoken. You see, there, there can't be two truths. Ezekiel is either right or the foolish prophets are right. Both can't be right. Truth can only be one. They are lying pretenders, using and abusing others for their own ends. This is their character. This is what they're like. Their minds, their image, their failings, and all rooted in their very character. But then, thirdly, the pronounced decree, verses 8 and 9. The pronounced decree. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, and here we have the reason for the decree, ye have spoken vanity and seen lies. God is the God of truth. The Lord Jesus Christ could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there can be no agreement between the truth and the lie, between the light and the darkness. One must expel and expose the other. The light by its very nature must expose the darkness, and the life must uh, dominate over death. God decrees here judgment because of lies. But notice also God's resolve in this. Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. God takes this, as we said a number of times already in Ezekiel, God takes this personal. Just as he commands Ezekiel to speak against the prophets of, of deceit, God says, I am against you. It's personal. That's why we, we cannot settle with general statements. We must be specific. We must address the issues of the day out of fear of God and out of love for souls. We notice also the righteousness of the decree in verse 9. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. This is a righteous judgment. Therefore the hand of God comes upon these workers of falsehood. We see its result also in the verses, a fourfold result of the decree. First of all, they are removed from the people. They shall not be in the assembly. There is excommunication here. They will not be in the assembly of my people. But they're also removed from memory or membership, we might say. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Just like we have a membership book in our church. So God says they will no longer be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Their memory will be blotted out. They will not be remembered. And John Gill says, and quoting the Targum, that this would seem to suggest also the blotting out their names from the book of life, or the Lamb's book of life. Proverbs 10 verse 7 says, The memory of the just is blessed but the name of the wicked shall rot. Removed from memory. They're also removed from the land. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. They will not return. Yes, captives will return, but it will not include this number. They will not be with the returning captives. And again, the result is these words that is repeated at least three times in this chapter and many times, I haven't counted the times, but many times throughout Ezekiel, this phrase, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. You see, for the nation, the reason it was in its captivity is because it did not know the true God. There was no personal saving relationship 
to the Lord. And God would have to do all of this just so they could get to the point of knowing who the true God is. A threefold removal and then a recognition that God had done this. This is the pronounced decree. But then, fourthly, the peace of delusion, or the peace that is a delusion, in verses 10 to 16. Notice, first of all, it is a pretended peace. It doesn't exist, verse 10, because even they have seduced my people, saying, peace, and there was no peace. God was at war with them and they were at war with God. And meanwhile, the false prophets are saying to them, all is well. God loves everybody. That's the call of today, isn't it? The Bible clearly says that God does not love everybody and we are not to say lies. We're not to tell lies in the name of God. Him that loveth violence my soul hates, says the word of God. It's a lie to say, outside of the elect of God, this is a lie. It's true for the elect, but it's not true for those outside. It's not true to say, God hates the sin and loves the sinner. That's not biblical. God hates the sin and the sinner. God would not send anybody that he loves to an everlasting damnation. Those who go to everlasting damnation are hated in the very soul of God. That's what the Bible teaches. Anything different than that is a lie. A pretended peace, but then, secondly, a wall of protection that is useless. So, they hadn't built up the hedge, but now there's this sort of wall, and again, it's it's a It's just an image, isn't it? One builds up a wall, and the wall could be anything. All these arguments, well, God is the God of love, and God is not too serious about our lives, and so on. This wall of protection. And then others come and daub it, or put untempered mortar, a mortar that is useless, that just washes away with the rain. A useless wall of protection. Representing Useless words and promises. Notice this wall will not stand the test of God's judgment. Verse 11. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall and a stormy wind shall rend it. And this is the wind of God's judgment. The lies spoken in the name of God will not stand the judgment of God. The shame that results, verse 12, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed? And on the day of judgment, imagine the picture. These false preachers, these false ministers who who give all the false promises to the people, they will stand with their people on the day of judgment and all together will be condemned under the light of God's judgment. And all the false promises, all the false uh, things that were erected to give people comfort shall come crashing down on that day. We have been tempted many times by people to tone it down. To be a little more gentle in your preaching. Speak smoother things. Notice the warning of righteous judgment against this wall. This false wall of false promises to a a people in danger of God's judgment. Verse 13 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it. I myself will break this wall apart with a stormy wind in my fury. God will do it. Because God hates all that is said in His name that is false. 
and it will be consumed. God forbid that we would ever say anything that's not from the Word of God. Let us not speak from our minds. Let's not speak from our hearts. Let's not be true to our inner self. Let us be true to the Word of God. Let us be true to what He has said. Because there's nothing in my brain that is of any good for you. There's nothing that comes from me that is of any benefit to your soul. It's only what comes from the Word of God. We see the foundation exposed when this wall is broken down. Verse 14. And I will break down the wall that you have daubed it with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground and the foundation is exposed. God gets right down to what's at the very bottom of all this, exposing the foundation. You see, people think they can deceive God. People think they can live their lie and get away with it. God goes right down God exposes the intents, the motives, what's right down deep in our hearts. Listen, the more we discover our inner self, the more we should be afraid of ever relying on our inner self. The foundation is corrupt. The foundation is not worth relying on. There's only one word. That is a ground for your life, and that's the Word of God. And that's why, brother and sister, if you're living week to week and you're not in the Word of God daily, you're not trusting the Lord. You're trusting yourself. You must be in the Word of God daily. The level to which you're not in the Word of God shows the level to which you trust yourself. You're, you've become just like the world. You you say. You're a Christian, you say you're evangelical, but you're not in the Word of God, therefore you're trusting in self. You see, the the need today is not to come to a, a, a service where the Word of God is preached and we say, Amen. And then we go away for another week, close our Bibles, put it on the shelf, and come back then once a week say, Amen. No, it's living by this Word daily. Obeying this word specifically. That's the foundation. We see God's wrath is appeased and satisfied in this judgment in verses 15 and 16. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar. Again, we see here it's not just the work, but the people that are judged. It's the wall and them. And will say unto you, the wall is no more. On the day of judgment, all the false promises, all the pretended lies shall melt away and be gone. And one thing will be left. The truth of God. Let God be true and every man a liar, says the Apostle Paul. On the day of judgment, Only God's truth will stand. In the book of Daniel, we have that picture of the kingdom of Christ uh, bringing all the other kingdoms down, crashing to the ground, and one kingdom lasting. His kingdom alone is an everlasting kingdom. In verse 16, it says, The prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, which see... Visions of peace for her. And there's no peace, saith the Lord God. Why is it that most people would rather listen to Oprah Winfrey than a godly preacher of the Word of God? Because they want the the vain promises. They want somebody who will say, well, you know, once you're true to yourself, it doesn't matter who your God is, who your power is, Just be true to yourself. It's exactly the problem in Ezekiel 13. God says, 
Woe to the prophets who speak from this, who speak from their own ideas, their own spirits, their own imagination. The peace of delusion, a deluded peace. And then finally, the pillows of deceit. <laughs> I like pillows. <laughs> Love pillows. Especially just lying down and having a nice sleep. And that's okay in that context, but not in this. Pillows of deceit that enable people to rest to destruction are not good pillows. It's not a good rest. Ezekiel is told to be against the false female prophets. There, Here's another similarity with our present day, isn't there? With the rise of false prophets, we see also the rise of many false female prophets who are very popular, who sell books by the millions. But it's pillows of deceit. It's words of deception. Again, they're the same type of prophets as the ones before who prophesy out of their own heart. And this is why they're popular. Because they're so caring. They, they seem so genuine. They, they seem so compassionate. They know me. They understand me. They, they can communicate with me on a different level. Pillows of deceit. Notice he was to set his face against them. He was to preach against them. There can be no silence for God's servant in such a situation. We must preach. You know, the prophet said, when I said I would keep silence, his word was like a fire in my bones. One way to know if you're really called to be a preacher of God is to try and stop for a while. <laughs> you know, just try and stop for a while. And you won't be able to because God has called you to preach his truth. Preach his word. It says in verse 18, they sow pillows to rest on so that people can sleep in their sin. They, it says they sew them to the armholes or the elbows. As it can also be translated. The, the, the image is, is strange. You're, you're always ready for a rest. You're, you know, at a moment's notice, you can just lie down and sleep. The nation was living in a, in a spiritual state of slumber. And that's why Paul says in Romans, Awake, you that are asleep. Wake up. And Christ shall give thee life. Rather than shepherds of God's people, they are hunters of them. Look what it says in verse 18. They make kerchiefs, or as we would say, handkerchiefs, upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. It's difficult to say exactly what this means. But the, the motive is the important point. Rather than just like when Ezekiel gets to chapter 34 and the shepherds who, rather than feeding the flock of God, feed off the flock of God. Hunting souls. Just like Nimrod, who was a, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Here they're hunting down, living off God's people. And God says, will ye hunt the souls of my people? Do you dare? Do you have the courage to stand in my face. But also they are challenged, will you save the souls that come unto you alive? You have no power. You have no power. I will not allow you to hunt down the souls of my people. And you have no power to kill. And you have no power 
to make alive, the Lord Jesus said that he was the one alone who held the keys of death and hell. Also, they misrepresent God and pollute his name and character. Verse 19, will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, all for personal gain? They are willing to sacrifice God on the altar of personal gain. Using God for money. And also there's a complete exchanging of the will of God regarding who's to be saved and who's to be lost. They slay the souls. Get this in verse 19. They slay the souls that should not die and save the souls alive that should not live. They're a complete contradiction to God. They love the wicked and hate the righteous. They kill the righteous and give life to the wicked. We see that, don't we, in our modern day? Not just within the church. We see it within the nation. We see in, in abortion where the thousands by the year, in this, this small country, thousands of unborn children are are slaughtered every year in this country, while those who should at least never see the light of day out of a prison are released. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We live in an evil time, a wicked time, in the church and in society. Their church, their church, is filled with the damned, and that's why when you look at the likes of a, a place like Joel Osteen, you see 20, 30,000 people, it's, it's a church of the damned. They're all going to hell together. Because anybody that could sit under that preaching is not a child of God. Anyone who thinks that's the word of God is not one of God's people, unless they repent. Their church is filled with the damned. And they condemn God's people. The means of this is deceit and deception by your lying to my people that hear your lies. They are God's people officially, but not God's people in practice. The Lord's response in verse 20. It's a fixed response. Behold, thus say the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, your false rest, your slumber of damnation. I am against these pillows wherewith you hunt the souls to make them fly. It's a fierce response. I will tear them from your arms. The idea is they're they're sold to them. They will be ripped off. All their pretended peace will be torn away from their flesh. Their rest would become the very means of their judgment. It's a freeing response. And will let souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. It is a final response. And they shall no more, verse 21, and shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. Only God can deliver the captives. We see this, don't we, with the Lord Jesus Christ walking through the land of Israel. A land held captive by the the falseness and the lies of the scribes and Pharisees. And Christ brings liberty to the captives. Freedom to those who are hunted by the people who should have set them free. And you shall know that I am the Lord again. And lastly, the reason of this response, it's twofold. They hurt the righteous in verse 22, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. And then they help the wicked. And you strengthen the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. In other words, what they say is this. You can go on living the way you live and still go to heaven. 
you promise him, you know, again, Mr. Osteen, when he was interviewed, and he said, I don't use the word repentance. I don't use the word sin. Other people use those words. What's he saying? You can live the way you want and still go to heaven because God loves everybody. The conclusion in verse 23, Therefore you shall see no more vanity. It will be snatched away from you, nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. A day is coming when every knee will bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every tongue shall confess. On the left and on the right, everyone, saved and damned, all will know that He is the Lord. Praise to His name that we today, by His grace, can say we know that He is the Lord. He is our Lord. This God is our God. He will be our guide even unto death. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together from that psalm again. Psalm 92, verses 12 to 15. Psalm 92, verses 12 to 15. But like the palm tree flourishing shall be the righteous one, he shall like to the cedar grow that is in Lebanon. Those that within the house of God are planted by his grace, they shall grow up and flourish all in our God's holy place. Psalm 92, singing verses 12 to 15. We'll, we'll stand to sing. Let's stand. But like the palm tree flourishing shall be the righteous one. He shall like to the Father, we, we rejoice that in a day of lies, pretense, false hopes, that we have a righteous God, 
a God who is all holy and free of all deceit. And that, Lord, we can trust wholly and completely in all that you have said and all that you have done and all that you are. And that is why, Lord, we worship the King of glory. Because he is the shepherd of our souls, the savior of our spirits, and the one who has made us free from the darkness of this world and delivered us from the enemies of our souls. Bless us now as we turn to the Lord's table. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.